Analyzing moving particles is a fundamental part of scientific research today, particularly in modern particle physics. And this is all about how you shoot charged particles through electric and magnetic fields and you see how they behave. Take, for example, this image. This image is taken from a bubble chamber. And what a bubble chamber is, is it's essentially a li liquid hydrogen tank, usually. And what you do is you shoot in charged particles through it. They make all these sort of curved little paths because of the magnetic field that basically is exerted onto the tank and you observe the tracks that they form. The way that the tracks are formed is the particles collide with the hydrogen in the tank and they ionize the hydrogen. And this forms gas which forms bubbles in the tracks that they leave. And that's why it's called a bubble chamber. And you can see that these are the individual tracks of all these particles. Some of them are extremely small, as you can see, they're small spirals. Some of them are bigger spirals. Some of them are absolutely huge. So why do they make spirals in the first place? How do we figure out which one is which? That's what we're going to learn about in today's video. But first of all, I think we need to go back to the basics and learn a bit more about what happens when a charge is moving in a field and right now we're going to use the magnetic field so remember Fleming's left hand rule and that's Fleming's left hand rule right here remember to use your left hand and put your hand in this formation the thumb points to the force on this this points to the field north to south this points to conventional current which is positive to negative and I want you to take this into particular consideration now, imagine if you have a field right here and the blue circle is where the field is exerted and the electron beam goes in. You can see that it's deflected because of the magnetic field, but before it's def it enters the magnetic field and after it leaves the magnetic field, you will realize that the lines are straight. Only within the field is it a curved path. Second of all, let's try to figure out which direction this is going to go in. I want you to take a look at this position first of all. Point your finger into the field. So that's that means that the field is going into the screen in your case. And now we have to point the conventional current. This is an electron beam. Conventional current is a flow of positive to negative. Over here we have a negative flow that's flowing this way, which means a positive flow has to flow in the opposite direction. So this is an electron beam and therefore, even though the electrons are moving here, conventional current is going to be moving here because it's the flow of positive charges. So we have to move the middle finger in the opposite direction of the motion of the electron beams. So you try to do that and you eventually get the thumb pointing directly upwards. Now try to do it in this position. What do you get then? Well, then you get the force in this direction and this direction, and you realize that it's a curved path. Now, remember that the direction of the conventional current flow is the flow of positive charges. It is the opposite direction to electron flow, which is what we just covered. So the force due to the magnetic field is always at 90 degrees to the velocity of the electrons. That's pretty much obvious. These are all 90 degrees to the velocity of the electrons. The oscilloscopes, monitors, and television sets of the past had displays which made use of electron beams. They were moved about until magnetic and with magnetic and electric fields, resulting in rapidly changing images on the screen. So what they basically did is, if electrons strike a surface, for example, a phosphorus surface, they actually produce flashes of light. So if you can control your electron beams, move it up and down and up and down, and can create maybe like a slow scope obviously they couldn't be that complicated because then you would need so many different electron beams that would be very difficult to control with multitudes of different magnetic fields but for simpler things like oscilloscopes the electron beams could do the job now we're going to take a look at some very useful apparatus especially in this chapter and that's called an electron beam tube now what this is is basically this thing shoots a beam of electrons onto this. And what is on the, you know, this is a glass sphere, by the way, like a sort of a light bulb, if you may. 
and what's on this side of the glass sphere is on this wall there is phosphor powder the phosphor powder as i said lights up when electrons strike it and so we can see where they're striking because it's going to have a little flash of light that's kind of what it is what we do here is there's an electron gun and the electron gun produces the electrons and this is directed to the field uh, to the screen by the use of parallel plates and they form a uniform electric field for instance if this was positive and this was a negative flow of electrons obviously it would veer off to the positive because electrons are attracted to the opposite charge this would be negative which will repel the electrons so that's what the parallel plates are there for. The electron gun, on the other hand, has a heated cathode, which is a heated piece of metal, which is going to emit uh, electrons. That, I believe, is called thermionic emission. <clears throat> and thermionic emission basically means that the thermal energy given to a certain piece of metal is going to excite the electrons. And if enough is given, then it can actually even ionize some um, atoms and that's going to give us um, a bunch of electrons coming out now what happens to these electrons that are emitted well they're accelerated because they're negative and here we have a positive piece of metal which is the anode so they're accelerating towards the anode and so they have gained some sort of velocity in a certain direction this allows them to be in a certain straight line all traveling together which basically puts them through the sphere. And the sphere is in vacuum. And I think that is pretty self-explanatory, but it has to be in a vacuum because of the fact that the electrons are going to hit the air particles and they're going to be ionized, they're going to stop moving, etc. So in order to prevent that from happening, we make it a vacuum. There's nothing in their way. So now let's look at the magnetic force on a moving charge. If you had watched my previous video on magnetic field density, you should know that a force on a length of metal in a magnetic field is going to be F as B I L. B stands for magnetic flux density. Now, this is for a force that is exerted on a long piece of metal in a field, right? However, we're going to talk about one single charge. Now, to convert this, we just do some simple substitutions. So we know that the current over here, we're taking out the current. That's charge per time. So we can actually put this, substitute it into this. We get F is BQ over TL. And then we can actually single out L and T, which I've done here. BQ times L over T. L over T is length traveled divided by time taken, which is velocity. So... F is VQV, magnetic flux times the charge of the particle times the speed of the particle. So for a charged particle moving at an angle theta to the magnetic field, F is BQV sine theta, because we also learned in the previous video that if there is a length of metal that is at an angle to the, um, the field, right, the magnetic field, then it's going to be BIL sine theta. So we just kind of use the exact same thing because the I is going to be substituted all the same. So it's just BQV sine theta. For an electron with a charge of negative E, the magnitude of the force on it is F is BEV and E is this value. All right, now let's picture a particle moving at right angles to uniform magnetic field. It's going to always have a cir circular path because the magnetic force F is always perpendicular to its velocity. Take a look, for example, at the diagram that we have before. Imagine if I expanded this blue circle to fill the whole entire page. Then the, the force that's 90 degrees to the path will continue. And it, actually, the electron beam will travel in a circle. So you get how that happens, right? Each time you do the Fleming's left-hand rule, you're going to get that the force that is being exerted on the electron is 90 degrees towards a certain point. Now that sounds very familiar to us, especially if you have already studied centripetal force. And this is going to give us that magnetic force F is actually a centripetal force. It is always directed towards the center of the circle. 
So that's very interesting. And this basically explains why we have these spirals. Now, in the cloud chamber, you know, like now we know that these particles form circles. How, why, how can we explain the fact that these particles travel in spirals? They get smaller and smaller. Like if theoretically, shouldn't they just curve in a circle and keep curving in a circle and never decrease and never change? Well, we can actually explain that. In the cloud chamber, the particles ionize the hydrogen. That's how the tracks are formed. That's how the bubbles are formed. They lose momentum as they ionize the hydrogen because they have to collide with the hydrogen molecules to ionize it. And therefore, their track spirals inwards. When they have lower momentum, then they have a lower radius. And that's what we can prove in the next slide. We can calculate the radius of the orbit of a charged particle in a uniform magnetic field. We know that centripetal force is mv squared over r. Force on a single charge, E, is going to be that. So basically, we have BEV, which we've already covered before. F equals BEV. Now, centripetal force is the force on a single charge, right? So we have BEV equals to mv squared over R. We rearrange that and we get R is mv squared over BEV. And we can eliminate the V on both sides and we get mv over BE. Now, mv sounds very familiar to us. It's mass times velocity, which is momentum. mv over BE is R, mv is BER, and P, which stands for momentum, is BER. So, we've gained two very, very useful equations. And we have the conclusion R is this, momentum is BER. From this, we can tell that if you have a faster moving particle, you know, when V goes up, then R goes up, right? It's directly proportional. They give you bigger circles. If you have greater mass, you also get bigger circles. So, you know, greater inertia, you get bigger circles. If you have a stronger field, for example, when B is bigger, because B is magnetic flux density, the higher the magnetic flux density, the stronger the field, then you're going to get tighter circles because you see here that B is inversely proportional to R. So what this tells us is, you know, when there is a greater momentum, then you're going to get a bigger circle. When you have a stronger field, you're going to get a tighter circle. If you're lighter, if you're slower, you're going to get a smaller circle. And these circles will eventually spiral inwards like this because of the fact that they lose momentum. When you lose momentum, mv goes down and r will also go down and that's why as they lose momentum the r becomes smaller and smaller and they tr spiral into the middle once they stop moving that's when you know the momentum has become zero r becomes zero they just stop moving now so knowledge of this can be used in mass spectrometers particle accelerators and in calculating the charge to mass ratio but before we look at that let's try to explain this now, this is an electron, and it's traveling in this direction. I want you to get out your hand, your left hand, Fleming's left hand rule. Point your forefinger into the screen, as it tells you over here with the X. And then you have to point your middle finger downwards, because remember, this is traveling upwards, but it's an electron. We follow conventional current. And if you're doing it right, you would get the fact that the force is inwards. So... You do it again over here, you get the force going in like this, like this, like this, and you know, that's the centripetal force that I'm telling you about. And it keeps going until it forms the spiral. What about a proton? If a proton is traveling in this direction, conventional current is in that direction. It follows the proton because conventional current is the flow of positive charge. So you put your hand orientation like that and you would eventually get the fact that the force is inwards like this so the opposite direction so the direction in which they spiral can already tell us the charge but remember that the proton is significantly bigger than the electron and that basically tells us that this has more mass um, provided that we can keep the velocities of the two particles constant so that's how we explain these two different curves. Now we're going to do some calculation work. We're going to find out the electron, like the charge to mass ratio, which was also very helpful back 
day. Basically, we have this equation, r is mv over be, we can rearrange it to get e over m is v over br. So we tell, they tell us that in order to get this ratio, we need to get the velocity as well as the magnetic flux density as well as the radius. Now measurements of the radius is very difficult because for the vacuum tube there is room for parallax error. If you're trying to get uh, a spiral and you're trying to get the radius of this spiral but you're in like this is inside a tube or this is inside a hydrogen chamber there's a glass between it there's space between it so even if you measure it with a ruler or something um, there's going to be room for parallax error also this is a very small track now to calculate the velocity what we do is we have to use the cathode anode voltage imagine the electron gun again we have the cathode which emits electrons and then we have the anode and this gets accelerated through this section right what we're trying to do is we're trying to get the voltage difference between these two so because they are going to accelerate the electron the final velocity with which the electron emerges from this section is going to be whatever velocity was gained through this part it's how much this voltage difference accelerated the electron now voltage is the work done per charge it's joule per coulomb so the total work done on this electron okay let's assume that this is a single electron is going to be ev now ev is going to be the kinetic energy of the electron which is one out of mv squared and that's what we have here and so we just do the math and we get that you know this is this so from this we get the fact that v is this and we substitute v into this equation we arrange it here and there and then finally we end up with this equation which tells us e over m is 2 ev um and the voltage um of the cathode and the anode over b squared r squared that's how you calculate the electron to mass ratio so i think that's about it when it comes to the first part of charged particles, which is just talking about the tracks that they take and the general concept. Thank you for watching.